So what does all this storytelling have to do with ethics? Well, in one way, not much, but therefore quite a bit. Contemporary ethics likes to classify ethical theories according to three main concerns, duty or deontology, virtue, and consequentialism. Well, up until now in Genesis, there has been little substance about any of those three concerns. Regarding duty, there have been few rules and there's been even less obedience to the few rules that God has given. Regarding virtue, there is precious little on display in Genesis and even through the whole Torah. Israel in the wilderness has basically no virtue to show. They are a bunch of petulant ex-slaves that resent their freedom. And as we've seen, Abraham and his family belong on a reality show rather than a moral pedestal. And regarding consequences, regarding ethical systems that are judged by their fruits, the outcomes so far at the end of Genesis and really at the end of Deuteronomy have been wholly ambiguous. And you know, that doesn't change much as the Old Testament wears on. We are not seeing the kind of results in Israel that a consequentialist ethic would be satisfied with. And this is part of the power and the charm of these narratives in Genesis and really all through Deuteronomy. They are realistic. They portray us warts and all. They portray humanity more as anti-heroes than as moral heroes. So on the one hand, these stories seem like the wrong place to found an ethic or a vision of goodness. And yet these stories are Israel's heart and soul. And the New Testament church looks to them as essential guidance. And that to me is of huge ethical significance because it suggests that we are in a habit of founding our ethical visions on the wrong foundations. Israel's ethic isn't built on consequences or virtue or even duty. Israel's ethic is built on its own peoplehood in its beginning in a sheer promise that God gave to a random person in an unworthy world. God's promise to Abram, which becomes a promise to all of us through Abram, is peoplehood. Peoplehood seems essential to human flourishing, to God's goal for humanity, and to the character of God's kingdom, which resolves in a fellowship of saints, the people of God. Signs of those three moral foundations might be scarce, but much more evident in these stories are faith, trust. Here's another retrospective on this from Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So the writer to the Hebrews finds in Abraham exactly what Paul finds him in Romans 4, an exemplar, not of a moral life, but of faith, of trust in God's promises even when God's promises seem to contradict God's own commands. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. And by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his own staff. Their faith is pretty small compared to Abraham's. And that's another thing these stories demonstrate. Your faith can be ginormous or your faith can be as small as a mustard seed. Either way, it's enough for the God of Israel to work with so faith is on display in these stories much more than those usual moral foundations for ethics. So is hope that God is bringing about something to look forward to. David J.A. Kleins is an Old Testament scholar who wrote an old and influential book called Theme of the Pentateuch. He finds the theme of the Pentateuch to be three promises. Promises of posterity for Abraham. We already covered that. That's an object of hope. Promises of a relationship with God as covenant people and promises of land for those patriarchs and for the peoples they will beget. All of those are objects of hope alongside faith. And finally, we see a lot of love. God's whole covenant with Israel is a fulfillment of God's loving promise to those patriarchs and God's endurance of Israel during those difficult 40 years in the wilderness are love, heartbreaking, painful, sacrificial love. The substance of the covenant in the end of Exodus and in almost all of Deuteronomy is love. It's the celebration of a relationship between God and God's people. On Sinai and at the end of Deuteronomy and its blessings and curses, we see love, ironically, in the foreshadowing of Israel's apostasy 
and ruin, and then God's loving restoration of it to fulfill its blessings. The bulk of Leviticus and the last chapters of Exodus show us love in the contextual meaning of Israel's liturgical objects, the tabernacle, the priests that serve it, and the rites that both they and all Israel celebrate. God sustains Israel in 40 years of tough love in the wilderness. God judges, forgives, and matures Israel. Those stories fill the book of Numbers, and they're recapped at the beginning of Deuteronomy. And there's love in God's gift of the land's conquest for the sake of the patriarchs and the people's gratitude in return. Those sentiments frame the beginning and the end of Deuteronomy. Don't just think of the Torah as narrative and rules in the abstract. Think of the Torah as the founding origin story of this people. For millennia, this people has reread and reread the Torah every year in synagogue to remember who they are and therefore understand what's expected of them and what they can expect in the future. Natural law ethics, especially in the Catholic tradition, tends to make nature foundational to grace. It's the platform on which we gain a grasp of what God is doing beyond what nature can grasp. The Torah suggests a different story, that relationship is foundational. The real basis for this people to know the God that created all things in a unique way is this relationship. It's that God reached out to Abraham and started something new. And that means Israel's first ethical task is narrative. It's to remember, to remember the commandments and to remember the stories. Here's Moses to Israel on the eve of its entry into the promised land. Deuteronomy 4.9 Take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. Israel soon forgets, and they reap the consequences of that. And that leads us to another big chunk of Israel's scriptures, the former and the latter prophets. But Jesus remembers his quoting of Deuteronomy in the wilderness against the devil demonstrates that Jesus understands Israel's narrative task and he can accomplish it. He remembers and he observes it. His disciples do too, eventually. They learn to remember and to understand and to act. They echo and they presuppose Old Testament traditions throughout the New Testament with a messianic twist. And that task of remembering is hugely important to the apostolic church as it figures out that the gospel is not just for Jews, nor does it just turn people into Jews. It comes from Abraham's earlier cosmic promises to bless all the families of the earth. That kind of narrative remembrance is key to a lot of the New Testament's arguments about things like circumcision. That's getting ahead of ourselves. We need to stay in the Old Testament for a while longer. Because though these narratives are essential for the greater thing that's born in Jesus' arrival, they're still essential to forming the lesser thing that midwives it, the people of Israel, a people prepared. 